Welcome back to the channel. Everything is all painted for our 2012 Lexus IS 250. So let's start throwing it all back together and see how much we can remember. So we'll start by throwing our taillights in there. If you remember, Scott's Lexus Emporium had an 08. So this is an aftermarket taillight because it's a 2010 and up. And it's a good thing I saved what was left of the old taillight because it didn't come with the wiring harness and the bulbs. The bulb was no good, but I was able to put a new bulb in there, use the socket and the wiring harness to put it on here. Otherwise, I'd have to go buy all that. So always save your parts. Don't throw anything away until you're done with the project because you never know what you're going to need. So we'll clip it in there. We'll bolt it in. And we're going to do the same thing on the passenger side. Drop our harness in there. Line up the clip in the quarter with the front edge of our light. We did replace the clip in front of the light on the outside that the taillight slides into. Scott's Lexus Emporium happened to have one. So now we'll head over to the deck lid. We'll put our license plate lights in. These are the ones that came with our deck lid, even though somehow the original ones did survive. We'll throw those in a box and take them over to Scott's Lexus Emporium. and Maybe I can make a trade with him for future parts on Lexus IS 250s. Now we can snap our finish panel in there, line up the studs, and snap it in. Use your bumper installation tool, it's fine. Now we'll use our excessively long socket. You gotta get over those studs after all, so tighten it up. Put our camera in. Clip it into the deck lid. We'll put our button in. This is our used button, since the original one was melted. Bolt that down. We'll bolt our camera down and plug it in. Now we can put our taillights in. One's in the deck lid anyway. These are the reverse lights and the parking lights. Or are they the brake lights? I don't know. I guess we'll figure it out when we check them. Drop the harness through and snap them in there. Don't close the deck lid or they'll end up on the floor. And we can put the plugs into the deck lid. And we can bolt them in. And plug them in. Still using that excessively long socket, but it's the only 10 millimeter I haven't lost yet. Now we made our OEM template for our name plates on the back. I assume this is how Toyota does it. They just don't want you to know. We'll slowly peel it off. It lines up our bottom edges and our side. There's a couple of little pins that align the zero and I think the two, maybe the S. So as long as we have them spaced out right and got the right height, we should be good. So we'll stick that template to the inside of one of our windows and we'll pull our name plates off. Got to be careful because we do need these. We were missing a few letters on our used deck lid and it happened to be a 350. We do have to make sure we don't tear up those alignment pins. So when we get to one of the pieces with the alignment pin, just kind of work our way around. Must be the S with the alignment pin in it. It is. So our two should come out, no problem. Our zero, oh, five. Dyslexic, okay. And our zero has the alignment pin in there. So we'll work our way around that pin so we don't break it off. Make our life easier when we try to put it back on. And we'll take these over to the retaping gnome. Let him retape those for us. As you know, I don't want to do it. So we need to put our bezel back in our gas door. We had popped out the little plastic retainers so that we could paint it. So we got to push those in first. They're a little hard to get in there with all the paint. So we just use the back edge of a screwdriver to push on it until they snap in. And we can put our little bezel in there and screw it in with our screwdriver before we get down to manufacturer specs. Now back to the deck lid. I'm going to loosen up these two screws because we have a, I don't know, I don't know what this thing does, honestly. Some kind of little cover. But it was in there, so I'm putting it back. 
one push pin, and then it screws into the lock and the button. We'll put our covers on our trunk hinges. One side snaps in, and the other side snaps to it. There's one little clip at the bottom. Then we can throw our carpeting on our deck lid. Make sure you make the carpeting face when you put it on. It's required. Put the push pin in there to hold it up and put the rest of our push pins in. We'll clip in our little escape lever. Let all the haters out that I've collected in my trunk. Make sure it works. Then we can put our handle on. Has two screws inside, so screw those in. And close the cover. You can put that on before the carpeting, but it's just easier to put it on after. Put our last push pin in there. And now we're going to cavity wax our frame rail, where we had all of our welds. It is the last part of any repair. If you skip this part, your repair was kind of worthless. Unless you live down south. Then cavity wax doesn't matter. But where I live, it's going to start rusting out right away. So we're going to make sure we coat the inside of that frame rail so that in a few years, this will be the only part of the car that's still left. Get a good coating in there. And we still had a little bit left in our can, so we'll do the back end again. We'll put our bumper brackets on our quarter. Just clip in and tighten up the bolts. Do the same thing on the driver's side. Get a couple extra off here because we had to paint this side. And we're going to change our useless bracket here. I believe this bracket is supposed to hold the wiring harness for the parking sensors, but this car doesn't have that option. I'm sure some experts will educate me on that one. So it really is useless. I probably could have left it off, but our old one was rusty. So I put in a nice, clean, rust-free one. And we'll clip our J-nuts on the bottom of our bumper. And we'll put these useless little plastic things on. I'm not sure what they do, but they're kind of stiffeners. Again, the experts can tell me what they do. I have no idea. And we'll bolt our reflectors in. They clip in on one side, and then there's one screw. Even if I don't know what stuff does, I still put it back on because the factory put it on there for some reason. I don't claim to know everything. Now we can put our window trim around the top of our window. Flip it in and line up all the holes. Since the compressors are off, we can't use our assault riveter. We're going to have to use the pump action riveter. Pop all of our rivets in there. We can slide our stationary glass in. Figure out how it goes in there. There we go. We'll slide the window track down there. Turn it and then push it in. It'll hold our stationary glass in. Screw in the top of it. And put the bolts in the bottom. And we'll put our window channel in. Flip it into the top of the door, and then back in the track that we just put in. Now we'll put our gasket across the top of our door. Kind of like rolls in there, put one side in and then push the other side in. Getting it started is the hardest part. Once it starts going, you just keep going along. Takes a little patience. I put off putting this door together just for that reason. I didn't have the patience at the time. Even though reassembly is my second favorite part of the rebuild, there are some parts that I just don't like doing. This happens to be one of them. And it seems like I always have to put doors back together. So, we'll make sure it's all in there. Give it a pat. That's not going anywhere. And we'll clip in our belt molding, slide it into the stationary molding, 
and use our belt mulling installation tool. And we can put our window up. We can put the gasket in for our door handles. Door handle. Put the front one in. We'll slide our handle in. Flip it in. We can put our cap in there. Snaps in. Our handle works. We'll tighten up the front bolts for our door handle. We'll pull the latch out and drop it down so we can get to the back bolts for our door handle. Because Toyota decided they didn't want to make extra holes. You should have to pull the latch out every time. Bend it down to manufacturer specs. And we'll slide the latch back up there. At least they made the latch very easy to slide up there. It's got kind of a Y, so as you move the latch up, the lever just kind of self-aligns. You have to really screw it up to miss it, and I have done that before. Check in, make sure it works. I didn't miss. Now we can put our molding around the top of our door. These are super easy. We clip right in. Wish GM could figure out how to do that. Put our push buttons in there. We'll put our rear door panel on. Put a little bumper in there. Putting that down to manufacturer specs. Now we're ready to put our door panel on. We'll clip in our cables for our lock and our handle. And we'll clip in our speaker. Now we're ready to slide the door panel on. And then push it on with our door panel installation tool. One screw behind the door handle. And one in the grab handle. We'll put our window switch in. Plug it in and snap it down. Now we'll put the little cap behind our door handle. Now we'll drop the sub in our package shelf. Plug it in. Set it down in there and bolt it down. If you're wondering why I jump around, uh, it's basically how I pull things out of the box that I throw everything into. So the stuff at the bottom goes on last. Unless there's a reason that needs to go on first. In this case, it doesn't. So we'll route our seatbelts, throw our insulation on the back. I'll throw our back piece of insulation on there. Tuck it under our sail panels. Throw the push pins in. Now we're ready to bolt our shade assembly in there. I think that's how it goes. Bolt it down. And plug it in. Now we can throw our package shelf on there. At least the rear portion of it. it clips in underneath the glass. This is a lot easier to do when the glass is out. You can't do this when the glass is in, but this is how the factory does it, so. How I'm going to do it. Besides, I don't have the glass yet. The yard that I bought the first one from broke it. So I'm waiting for the second one. Cost me an extra 10 bucks. Clip in our third brake light. And we'll clip that into our package shelf. Make sure everything's in there. Doesn't seem right. So now we can put the front of our package shelf in. We have to route the seat belts through this one. Set it up there. It's a two piece one because of that shade that goes up. If you don't have that shade, it's just a one piece assembly. We'll drop it down over the child seat hooks and clip it in with our package shelf installation tool. Bet you guys haven't seen that one before. Now we're going to check everything. Make sure our third brake light works and make sure our shade works. Not that the 
new owner is probably ever going to use it, but I want to make sure if he does that it works. Now it's time to put our heat shields on over our mufflers. And one of these things is not like the other. So I think we're going to have to smash the other one to make it match. Or we can straighten out the smashed one. So we're going to put it in the vise. We're going to use a socket and tighten it up right where the bolt would be. Crank it down there. And stretch it back out. Kind of the opposite of what happened in the accident. A better grab on this. There we go. So when we got it pulled out a little bit, we'll hammer out the rest of our kinks. This is not structural, so we can straighten it out. It's just a little piece of aluminum. So all of our holes for the mounting studs were a little wrinkled up from when it got crushed. So we're just going to hammer them flat, make them back into the circles they once were instead of the ovals they are now. And all the structural engineers will tell me that this car will never be the same because I straightened an aluminum heat shield. I always get the question, how do I know where all the bolts go when I'm putting them back? Well, I keep them in the bucket that keeps them separated for what parts of the car they're for. And then I take them out of the bucket, group them all together, and that kind of jogs my memory and helps me remember where I took them out of. So we can put them back in the same place. So we'll put our heat shield up that we just straightened out. Bolt that up there. Not going anywhere. A little extra tweaking. Put the heat shield up on the passenger side. This one should fit. Then we can pull all of our plugs off of our overly complicated EVAP system that Toyota uses. We looped one line around to the other and put a cap on the one that was open. We just don't want all those vapors to be exposed or welding and grinding. So we closed everything off. Then we can put everything back together. We'll start all of our lines. We'll put a vapor canister up there. And we'll bolt it up. A couple little plastic clips that hold it in temporarily. And we put the real bolts in there. Or nuts. Then we can clip all of our lines on there. Clip in our safeties. Then we can snap in our wiring harness. And double check everything. I don't want to be chasing codes. Now we can throw our splash shield up and cover up all this nonsense and never speak of it again. Even though it is overly complicated, it's very rare that you have to go in there and fix anything. Unlike the simple GM systems that you have to fix constantly. So we'll tighten up our little plastic nuts and pull this cover up there. We don't want to go too crazy with the impact on those. Now we can bolt up our exhaust hanger bracket. We can go a little more crazy with the impact on these. These are some pretty hefty bolts for this little bracket. And there's three of them. Now we're ready to throw our exhaust up there. Uh, it's awkward, heavy, and I don't have a shadow gnome. So we're going to struggle a little bit. First, we got to get the little bar there through the rubber baby buggy bumper. And my experience in the circus is starting to pay off here. We got it. We can head over to the other side because we've got a free hand. Clip in this rubber baby buggy bumper. Clip in the one on the outside. And we'll head up to the front and clip those in. And then we should be out of harm's way. The likelihood of this landing on our head is diminished to almost zero, but never zero. One last hanger in the back. And now I put a little never seize on our bolts to be nice to the next guy. And we'll thread them in by hand. And marvel at the fact that I can do that without having to chase the threads or anything else because well, it's a Texas car. You guys got it so easy down there. I'll we'll tighten them down. Because somebody in Illinois is going to be taking these apart sometime in the future to replace the rotted out exhaust. I found some more push pins for the back of our EVAT splash shield. So we'll snap those in there. 
Now we can pull what's left of our bumper bracket off the bottom of our quarter panel. Then we can screw in our used bumper bracket that came with our bumper. That's one reason I do like to go to the junkyards and pull the parts myself, because if I would have bought this from a junkyard that took it off for me, I probably wouldn't have got this bracket, and that bracket saves me about 30 bucks. Now 30 bucks doesn't sound like much, but well, two brackets, $60, that's roughly one quarter of the bumper price. So we'll bolt in our other bumper bracket, and we'll put our absorber on. First we're gonna do a little cleaning. We don't let the clean freaks be too mad. Ah, that's enough. Now we'll put our absorber on. Just snaps in there. And we're ready to put our bumper cover up. Line it up with our brackets. It clips in across the bottom of the body panel and to those brackets that we bolted into our quarter. Use our bumper installation tool. Then we can put our screws up in the front. Tighten them down to half a ugga dugga. Drop our wheel liner down there. Put the clips in our wheel liner and one screw in the bottom. And our bumper's in on this side. Oh, one more clip for our wheel liner. Oh, a couple of clips in the bottom of the bumper. We also hold in our splash shield for our evap canister. And we'll put our brake line back in. We had it out of the way so that we could grind out a couple spot welds and so the painting gnome could get in there. We'll hammer that clip in with an actual hammer for a change. Bend that line back to where it's supposed to be. And it got a little tweaked. I'm pretty sure I tightened this line up, but we're going to check anyway with our torque wrench. Click. And now we can throw our wheel liner in. It's got a bunch of studs, so it kind of lines itself up. A lot easier to put in that way. And we'll put all our knots on there. Hold it in. Quite a few. I didn't want it going anywhere. And a couple plastic clips. Now we're off to the front end. We're going to put our bumper together. Snap our grill in here. We'll clip it all in. A couple push pins in each side. We can put our little gasket in. We'll have the rest of the gasket on the top of our grill. Now we can put our bezels in for our fog lights. Just snap those in there. One of these is brand new. I think it's this one. It is. Because it's clean. And we know I don't clean parts. So we'll snap the dirty used one in the other side. Probably going to throw the alignment off and everything now. And now we can change our fog lights over since we have that one broken one. One screw. Yep, just one. Yeah, that's no good. So we have our new one. Straight from China. And that's not the right one. That's the right one. So now we're going to stick this one in here. And because it came from China, it fits just like you'd expect. Close, but not perfect. So we'll slide the tabs in there, kind of force them in, screw it in. Good enough, not going anywhere. Now we're going to change over to the other side. I could have bought the OEM one, but I believe the set of these was $25, as opposed to the OEM one, which was $85 for one. So I'll deal with a little struggle of it not fitting perfectly. Because when it's all put together, you'll never notice. Tighten that screw down, and our fog lights are ready to go back in there. So we'll clip them in, and bolt them down. Same thing on the other side. 
Now we can snap the lower grill and the bumper. Just line up all the tabs and clip it in. Those holes on the outside edges, those actually line up with the ducts that go down to the brake calipers because apparently Lexus feels this is a performance car and you need to cool the brake calipers. We're gonna pull our energy absorber out the front, toss that in the pile. We got a brand spanking new one right from Lexus. This was actually cheaper than the aftermarket ones. And now with the Shadow Gnome's help, we'll throw our bumper up there. Plug in our fog lights. And I also have a harness connector for a harness that doesn't exist to plug in on my side. Flip it into all the brackets, underneath the headlight and then the fenders. And we'll put our bolts in there, put our bumper in. We have a little rock chip and the fender. We're gonna just touch that up. No reason to paint the fender. We put our little clips in. Ones we didn't break, we did get a couple new ones to replace the ones we did. We bolt our bumper in on the bottom. A couple of push pins. Snap those in there. and tighten up our rubber baby buggy bumpers and the grill in the center. Now we can drop our closeout panel in there. Oh, it's dirty. I can't believe he didn't clean that. We put in 600 new push pins because all the other ones were broken. And then we're back to the inside of the car. We're up in the sail panels, the C pillar. Slide into the package shelf. Then use our belt molding installation tool to clip it into the cord. Do the same thing on the driver's side. Slide it in. Line it up and smash it on there. Then pull the gasket out. Then we can put the lower trim on. Clips onto that upper trim that we just put in. And then there's a couple clips that go underneath the door gasket on the pinch weld that it slides into. So I'll smash into those, and it goes underneath the sill plate, so we didn't take our sill plate off. We got to sneak it under there. Make sure it's in all those little clips in our pinch weld, and snap our sill plate in. And pull our gasket out of there. Let's fold it over. Even though it was folded over from the factory, I still pulled it out of there. Flip in our trim on the other side. And put our sill plate in. This side I had off of there. Give the painting no more a little room to work. We can set our seat back in there. Put the seat belt over the top of it. And we'll pull the other seat belts around it. There's nothing worse than putting the seat in, bolting it down, and then figuring out that you gotta take it back off to get your seat belts out. Don't ask me how I know. So drop our seat back in there. There's a couple slots that it slides into in the package shelf. We'll bolt in the bottom. We'll bolt in our seat belt. Now we can slide our seat belts into their little holders. We managed not to let those things get clipped back in. So we'll slide them in there and then clip them down. Make sure they work. Go over the other side. Slide it in there and clip them in. And now we can throw our rocker moldings on. Oh look, Mr. Spotty showed up for work. The build must be over. Somebody's looking for a paycheck. So we'll just line up the little push-in clips. Snap it up there. Put our one screw in the back. Well, I guess it's more of a bolt since it has a 10 millimeter head on it. And there's one actual screw in the back door and then one in the front door. We'll tighten those up. And we'll put our bolt up in the front. Click. Now we can put all our little push pins across the bottom end.
and over to the passenger side put our other molding on. We had these off both so we could clamp it up to the frame rack and so that we could paint it. And where the clamps go in the frame rack, we do paint those spots so we don't have bare metal from where the clamps disturb the paint. And after it's done being painted, I also throw some cavity wax over the top of it so it's double rust proofed. Better than the factory. We'll snap all of our little push pins in across the bottom. Gives me a chance to lay down on the job and pretend like I'm doing something. I choose to do this on the floor instead of the lift because the lift is kind of in the way. It makes it hard to get to all these. So it just seems easier to do it on the ground where there's no obstructions. I think I got them all. Now I'll throw our back seat in. The detailing gnome was cleaning it while I put the rockers on. So now it's all clean. We'll run our seat belts through it. Just the buckles. Slide it into the tabs on the back. Make sure our buckles are all the way out. Then we'll clip it in in the front. You can use your bumper installation tool for that. And now we can start throwing our trunk together. We're going to put this piece in on the front, even though it's supposed to go in last. I don't know why I decided to do it backwards, but that's the way I decided to do it, so that's the way we're doing it. You can do it any way you want. Stuff it in there. It's a pain to get in there. The piece is on the side. I can't imagine it being any easier. Let's plug our light in. There's a couple of clips on the top that hold it in place. There's a couple of little clips that also hold it in place. I'm going to throw our side pieces on that we were supposed to put on first. Just tuck them in there. And we'll have to go up to the front and we'll have to tuck them behind the other piece that we already put in. Not a big deal. Pull it out, slide it over the top. Little push pins in the back. Now we'll put our liner on the other side. This one came from Scott's Lexus Emporium since our original one was a little crunched and had some holes in it. We'll have to tuck it in in the back. This is where it's nice having a parts car. Having to buy that piece, junkyards usually won't sell it to you. So if you have to buy a new one, I can't imagine how much they are. Usually like 100 bucks or so. Put our little cargo net hook in there and our push pin. We'll tuck it in behind our gasket. We'll put the little sill plate on. And our little covers on the bottom. We snap into those side pieces. Now we can bolt in the cargo hooks to hold this in place. We had to get those from Scott's Lexus Emporium since the old cargo hooks were kind of smashed. We'll drop our tray in the driver's side, bolt in those cargo hooks. So we do have an airbag light and it is not because the airbags went off or should have gone off. It's that the passenger seat is out of calibration. It happens a lot on Toyotas. You've actually seen me do it before on one of the other builds I did. It was a Toyota Camry. So it's really simple. We're just gonna recalibrate the passenger seat. So we need to go in our occupant classification and it'll pretty much tell us what to do. Zero calibration. You done reading? You must be, cause I am. So it tells us what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do that. As instructed, we're gonna Put the seat all the way down, front and back. Now we're going to recline it all the way forward. I guess make it stand up. Not really recline then. Now we're going to put the seat all the way as far back as it'll go. 
and we're going to make sure our headrest is down all the way. And there can't be anything on the seat while you're doing this. So when it's happy, you hit continue, press the button and it's going to do its thing. Wait five seconds. That was more than five seconds. And it's done. So our lights are off, everything's happy. Now we can change the battery in our fob because I'm tired of having to put the fob up against the start button to get it to start and not having keyless entry. So you pop the key out of the back, use the key to separate the two pieces. And now we can see the battery and ponder how we're going to get it out of there without making the 20 foot trip to the garage and getting a small screwdriver. Maybe the key will work. It did. Saved us a trip. Man, am I lazy. So we'll pull our new one out of the package. Came straight from AutoZone, not a sponsor. And the hardest part about this whole job of appears to be getting the battery out of the package. And we got the backing off. Still wrapped in plastic. It's childproof. You really don't want to get into this thing. All right, first attempt. Key gonna get this in there? Wrong key. Now I got the right key. There we go. I win. Pop our battery in there. Our back on there. And now our fob works. So we once again have keyless entry. We got a light. And now it's time to change our oil. Toyota style. Unnecessarily complicated. So we pull the cover down. We're going to take a bungee cord. We're going to strap it up to the front to keep it out of our way. We're going to loosen up the drain plug on the oil filter. And yes, I am wearing gloves. I have another job later on for hand modeling, so I've got to keep my hands in good condition. So after our drain has drained all the oil out of our oil filter, we can put our special oil filter socket on there and loosen it up because just having a regular spin on filter was too easy. Right, Toyota? Engineers can't manage to put drain plugs in trans pans where they'd be useful, but Toyota is over here putting them in oil filters. So we spin our cover out of there, slide our cartridge filter out of there, and we'll slide our new gasket on. Probably should have put the gasket on before the filter, but I only have two hands and I'm trying to show you what I'm doing. So, slide our little O-ring over it, and we'll use the oil on our gloves to lube it up, and stick it back in there. Our socket never fell off the cover, so we're just going to leave it on there, since we're going to need it again. Tighten it down to manufacturer specs. Click. Take our socket off. We'll pull our gasket off for our drain plug. Slide our new gasket up there. It comes with the filter. Push it into its little groove. And we'll put the drain plug back up there. Tighten that up. And we'll close up our little cover. Put our screw back in it. And there's one little push pin. 
it was missing from before. Now we can pull our oil plug out. And yes, that is a Harbor Freight socket on a snap-on ratchet. I think I probably broke some kind of rule there. But the best thing about the Harbor Freight sockets are when you ask somebody to go get you a socket and they ask you what size you need, you just say, I need a red. And if you're wondering why I chose to use such an enormously long ratchet, it's so I can tighten it down to Jiffy Lube specs and send it over to them. Now we're gonna fill it up with oil. And I have to show this, otherwise the internet will accuse me of not putting oil back in it. It's a thirsty little car, so it's gonna take more than the six quarts. Put our cap back on, tighten that down in manufacturer specs. Click. Click. And we'll check our oil. They have covers all over the place, but at least it's a happy car. Changing oil is very simple. On the top, we complicated the bottom. So our IS250 is all finished, ready to go. I put a, about 100 miles on it, making sure everything was okay. It's actually a pretty nice car. And I did have a lot of people that wanted to buy it. Unfortunately, it's already sold. I contacted the first person that wanted it and they had the money, so it became their car. If they hadn't had the money, it would have gone to the next person that contacted me. So whenever you see a car, it doesn't hurt to send me an email if you happen to want it. Get yourself in line because I go first come, first serve. The first person doesn't always have the money, which gives the second person a shot. Now we did clean under the hood, so everyone was freaking out that I put the dirty panels on. You can relax. We even cleaned inside the trunk. Look at that. And we cleaned inside the car. There was a little bit of Bondo dust in there. Our detailing gnome did such a good job that the new buyer came to pick it up and was actually afraid to get in the car because he didn't want to get it dirty. Everything was in pretty good shape. There was a little wear on the driver's seat, but what do you expect from a 10-year-old car? Well, it looks like this build is done, but there's only one way to be absolutely sure. It's time to play everyone's favorite game. You guessed it, what's in my console? Bolts. Now, I didn't have any extras. Those are from the parts car. I lost all the ones that go to this car. Oh. We got that inspection sticker for Texas that everybody said wasn't on the windshield, so this wasn't a Texas car. Guess what? It was. The windshield was replaced. They took the sticker off. That's why it wasn't cracked. What else is in here? Ah, the Hater's Tears bottle. And it's full. Toyota fans are so much fun to pick on. We'll hang on to that. What else is in here? so much easier when it's just a GMC emblem. Well, that looks like it. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.